Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Naylor and I serve as the President and CEO here at the National World War I Museum and we're delighted to have you here. So welcome. We want to welcome you to the museum and to the fifth of eight programs in the Wednesday evening speaker series as part of the State of Deception, Power of Nazi Propaganda exhibition. So ladies and gentlemen, it brings me great pleasure now to introduce you to Carol Seder, who's the President of the Board of Directors of the Midwest Centre for Holocaust Education, who will introduce what, who I think you'll be delighted uh, with tonight's speaker. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Carol. Thank you so much. You have to get used to a slightly different geographical accent this evening. <laughs> um, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Naylor. Uh, the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education is so very, very pleased uh, to present the traveling exhibit, uh, The State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda, um, produced, of course, by the United States Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum. Uh, but the important thing is the partnership here uh, with the, um, uh, the National Archives, who are hosting uh, the exhibit, and I, too, urge you to please Make, a, make sure you visit, because it runs just through October 25th. Um, and uh, it's on display at the National Archives, and we are also so very, very proud to be working in partnership with the National World War I Museum for this outstanding eight-part speaker series presented in conjunction with the exhibit. Um, the museum, as, as you know, is commemorating the centennial anniversary of World War I, and so this is all very, very special. Uh, tonight's program, World War I Posters and Visual Culture, is the fifth in the speaker's series, as Matt has just pointed out to you. Uh, it places Nazi-era propaganda in its historical context. And we're very pleased to have Professor Pearl James as our guest speaker this evening to discuss how patterns of communication established during World War I paved the way for the later propaganda that's featured in the exhibit. Um, Dr. Pearl James is an associate professor in the English department at the University of Kentucky where she received the 2014 Provost Award for Outstanding Teaching. While she was at Yale, she received her doctorate there in English Literature, and she became a student of World War I history. Her research since that time has focused on the understudied cultural experience of World War I in the United States. In her most recent book, published last year, entitled The New Death, American Modernism and World War I, Dr. James asserts that World War I ushered in an era in the way people experienced thoughts about death. Even Americans who participated from a further distance and for a shorter time experienced the difficulty of mourning for soldiers whose bodies were horribly damaged or literally disappeared. American writers many, and she's a professor of literature, including F. Scott Fitzgerald, William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, and Willa Cather, all sought to render the experience of foreign war on the American scene. Professor James brings an interdisciplinary and visual studies-oriented approach to her study of literature and culture and she teaches widely in literature, film, and cultural studies. Her talk tonight draws from her edited collection of essays entitled Picture This, World War I Posters and Visual Culture. It was published in 2009 
And the essays from, are from historians, art historians, and cultural critics who analyzed the production and impact of posters with various, from, that, that came from various belligerent nations, many, England, Germany, France, Russia, and the US. Her own essay in this collection focuses on the way American posters use gender and female figures to manufacture consent and enthusiasm for what many saw as a European conflict, not coincidentally analogous to posters analyzed at our last program by Dr. Ann Millen, illustrating similar approaches used by the Nazi party to influence women's acceptance of their changing role in the Third Reich. It's my pleasure this evening to formally welcome Dr. Pearl James to Kansas City and to our audience this evening to lead us in a studied exploration of World War I's influence on Nazi propaganda. Dr. James. Good evening. It's an honor to be here as the guest of the National Archives and the National World War I Museum. Um, this is my third visit to Kansas City, and I've learned more with every visit how valuable the resources here are for those of us who study World War I. It's a real treasure trove, and it's, it's a real resource. And, and as a scholar who's used the archive here and the National Archive, I have to thank you, Kansas Cityans, who have supported these institutions because they're, they are a national repository um, that's that, that have value for lots of us across the country. Um, tonight, although I've been to Kansas City before, tonight is really a first for me, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, as, as you just heard, my recent book is called The New Death, and in it I argue that the technologies of World War I ushered in a, a new horror about death um, into American culture. Um, this is difficult material, and it often sort of stuns my audience into a sort of a grim silence. However, when I viewed the State of Deception exhibit this morning, and I again looked over the program of speakers who have appeared in conjunction with it, it, it dawned on me for the first time, I'm the feel-good speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Visual culture of World War I looks downright cheery uh, in comparison to Nazi propaganda. So I'm going to try to embrace that role tonight, not talk too much about death. <laughs> um, the exhibit and all the other speakers, uh, it, they're really very focused on Nazi propaganda. It's a great exhibit. How many of you have seen it? A lot. Great. Yeah, those of you who haven't, I really recommend it. It takes about an hour and a half. It's really, it's really well done. Um, but tonight, I'm really kind of asking us to sort of bracket that and to direct our attention back 20 years um, earlier um, to a formative moment in the use of propaganda. And that's the moment of the First World War. And this is a moment when many Nazi leaders came of age and learned firsthand about how important propaganda was. In fact, the exhibition catalog makes a real, makes much of the fact that Hitler um, started his first role in the Nazi party was as a propagandist and a, you know, planning of meetings and disseminating information. Um, there are direct links between the propaganda of the two world wars. Um, during both wars, propaganda, there's my title, <laughs> um, during both wars, propaganda demonized the enemy in similar terms. During both periods, propaganda marketed charismatic leaders. And during both wars, um, propaganda tended to disguise war as peace. 
Um, and I think, you know, one could, I could sort of stand here and trace these parallels out and that would be very interesting. Um, however, what I want to do tonight is to shift our attention away from this striking imagery and towards something that's actually quite hard to see, um, which is the where and the how that these posters were exhibited. Um, one of the things I really appreciated about the State of Deception exhibit is its attention not just to what Nazi propaganda said, but how its messages were disseminated through visual culture, but also, since it was a little bit later, also through radio, which didn't exist during World War I, um, through film, and through other forms of mass media. Um, so as you walk through the exhibit, you'll see a radio, you'll see a phonograph player, you'll see some film strips, and all of these um, uh, pieces help you imagine not just the images but how people actually encountered them. Um, and that focus is really often missing in war poster exhibits. Um, when we view propaganda posters in a museum, um, they appear to us in a very different context than they did to their original audience. Framed and presented in the quiet of a museum space, they appear as art objects. But posters were manufactured in bulk on cheap paper for wide and short-term posting. They were never intended to be kept for so long. It's, it's actually quite amazing how well a lot of them have held up. The color is quite brilliant on some of these posters. And when you think about the cheap quality of the paper, it's, it's really stunning. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is to describe the media environment of, of total war in the United States during World War I so that we can better understand not just the what, not just the images that appeared in the posters, but the how and the where these propagandistic images did their work. Um, and here I'm asking, I, I also think it's useful to draw an important parallel between our own current uh, visual media environment and that of 1914-1918. We live now in an era of ubiquitous images and of media saturation. Paper and color printing are cheap, and petroleum and other engineered materials make it possible to wrap cars, trucks, and airplanes with ads. This is my neighbor's car. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's got some kind of a petroleum uh, wrap on it's a shrink wrap that, that has basically transformed his car into a rolling um, advertisement. Um, but more than this is the, the more important is the proliferation of screens which are just everywhere. Um, we see screens not just at home or at work but also in restaurants, airports, taxis, your own car, is that a good idea? I'm not sure that it's really so great to have a TV screen right next to the driver, but that's, that's coming. Um, uh, we also see them in, in doctor's offices. Um, screens are everywhere, and even if you're not looking at your own phone or tablet, it can be hard to avoid looking at a screen. And on these screens, images and video circulate around the globe with speed and reach that seems to us completely unprecedented. Um, I want to suggest that something analogous was happening during the war period. The expansion of visual imagery into new spaces and onto new surfaces also happened at an amazing rate at that moment. The war provided an occasion for advertisers, governments, and media companies to work together and collectively to partner, okay, um, and to collectively extend their reach with higher quality and more dramatic images than ever before. The war ushered in a new era of I image ubiquity that I, I think never really went away. And just as many of the images in our own media environment are crowdsourced, but they're created and uploaded by amateurs and eyewitnesses, and just as we work actively to navigate the media environment around us, so too individuals in the war period contributed to and shaped the media environment um, that they lived in. Okay, so what, what did that media environment look like 100 years ago? Um, in 1914, images circulated widely in newspapers, magazines, books, and on posters and billboards. All of those things were, were around. 
Um, people sent and collected postcards. I think you had someone talking about postcards in this series. Um, many people had their own cameras and were avid photographers. Newspapers were at the height of their circulation. Most cities had multiple newspapers with different issues coming out at different times of day. Um, magazines were popular and affordable, and unlike newspapers, they had colorful, um, very high quality covers and sometimes inserts um, that made them very attractive, and people would take them and cut them up and hang pieces of them on their walls or put them in scrapbooks. Um, and these media all reached wide audiences. The poster industry expanded drastically during this period as a direct result of the war. And as you'll see, its images crossed into and through these other more established and serious media formats. Um, when war broke out in 1914, the U.S. was not pulled in by treaty, as you know. Um, I, people in Kansas City, I think, know more about World War I than the average Americans, but bear with me as I rehearse a little bit. Um, you know, the U.S. remained officially neutral until 1917. Um, and many people argue, they use that point to argue that the war had a smaller impact on the U.S. than it did in Europe. You know, we just, we weren't in it as long. Um, but when we think about media and information, something like the opposite is actually true. The dissemination of propaganda was perhaps more intense in the U.S. than it was anywhere else. America's very neutrality made it the primary audience for propaganda produced both by the Allies and by the Entente, who each tried to sway the American public to see the war their way. So long before the government got involved in 1917, and we actually were going to war, various interest groups paid to have images printed and displayed. And it, the war was everywhere in terms of um, what people saw. Um, so for instance, in June 1915, the Boston Committee of Public Safety commissioned and printed this poster by Fred Speer. The image depends on the fact that its viewer would have been following the news and would be well aware of what had happened to a large passenger ship called the Lusitania. Okay, the Germans torpedoed and sunk the Lusitania off the coast of Ireland in 1915 while it was carrying 2,000 civilians, out of whom 1,200 died, including 128 Americans. And the Lusitania became a rallying cry for the Allies as an example of German barbarity. It was one of the you know, top examples of German barbarity. We know now that the ship was also carrying a large load of ammunition. Um, but at the time, that was a secret. Um, some posters portrayed the ship as a whole and tried to convey the passenger sense of shock and fear and to convey the collective death toll. Spears' design, however, is both more simple and draws on an honored visual tradition, that of the Madonna and Child. His design distills the essence of German barbarity as an attack on women and children akin to a slaughter of the innocents. The process of selling the war through images like this one then began long before the U.S. entered the war. Channels of communication were developed and certain images became iconic. Um, so, when in 1917 the U.S. entered the war, the proliferation in, of imagery and posters, you know, it just exploded. It was already there, people had already been reading about it and seeing these kinds of images, but it just, you know, went to the next level. Um, and one historian says, and I quote, America printed more than 20 million copies of perhaps 2,500 posters in support of the war effort. And he reckons that that's more posters than all of the other belligerent na nations combined. So it's a lot. OK, so where did all these posters hang? Um, we tend to think of posters as an advertising medium for cities and the public square. We picture, quite rightly, large billboards in a cityscape. And large, full-color posters did appear on billboards, in shop windows, and in theaters. But these images also circulated in many surprising locations. 
Propaganda was posted where merely commercial advertisement would normally not be permitted. The war made it legitimate and even a, uh, a matter of national necessity for images to enter places where they would not have been welcome in peacetime. Advertisers seized the opportunity of a national emergency to make themselves indispensable. And that industry attempted to mobilize, um, it, it, it tried to sort of cement its reputation as a viable and public spirited industry by working for the war. They wanted to seem like unselfish patriots who had only the nation's interest at heart. Um, they volunteered their work and they got to keep their autonomy. So the, the advertising industry really got to have it both ways. Um, they got to uh, have a lot of choice and control over the images and where they were hanging, but they were also operating with the sort of tacit um, under the mantle of the government. Um, in other belligerent nations, notably Germany, um, the governments themselves produced war propaganda. But in the US, it emerged from a creative blend of public and private interests. Um, the Poster Advertising Association, that's their professional organization, it donated designs, production, and display space. Industry leaders were very canny about the return this patriotic investment would bring. And if you read their trade papers, you can find them assuring each other that, quote, the unprecedented use of posters and the marvelous results attained by means of them has impressed the power of our medium upon the world's population so forcibly that all doubt that may have existed as to its efficacy has been permanently removed. So, I mean, if you study propaganda, I think one of the big questions is how do you know if it's effective? Right? I mean, you can see the image, but how do you know if people actually liked the image or believed the image and that, and that sort of thing? And the industry was really quite sure that they were having an effect. They, they attempted to really measure people's responses to their, to their product. Um, and they saw a, a, a leap in demand for their, for their stuff. And they really thought that this was um, going to pay dividends even after the war ended. So short-term sacrifices would pay off in the long term. And the advertising industry is just one of the many US industries that was, in a real sense, transformed as a result of mass mobilization and the advent of total war here in the United States. Um, as advertising capitalists became apparently civic-minded, the government itself got into the business of advertising. President Wilson appointed a prominent newspaper editor, George Creel. I think he has a Kansas City connection. Did we establish that at lunch? I, he, uh, I believe, might have been from Kansas City. Um, he headed a new agency that Wilson created called the Committee on Public Information. And it was widely known as the Creel Committee. Um, and it was essentially a propaganda committee. Um, it facilitated and pr produced government propaganda. Um, its publicity efforts included pamphlets, films, posters, press releases, cartoons, lectures, paintings, school essay and art contests, um, and more. One subcommittee, the Division of Pictorial Publicity, brought high art painters and popular illustrators together on a volunteer basis. They, these people would get together and meet as a committee. They would receive requests from various government agencies. The Navy wanted recruits, for instance. Um, and then they would talk about ideas. A certain illustrator would be given the job of making some designs for that particular need. Um, they'd go off and work independently and then come back and present it to the group. Um, and there would be a design review, and then the poster would go into production. So it was this kind of collaboration between artists um, and, and government offices, um, and also of organizations such as the Red Cross or the Salvation Army. Um, they also used the, the Creel Committee. Printers and billboard owners donated their material and manpower to print the posters and to actually get them up. After the war, Creel described their collective efforts as, quote, the greatest adventure in advertising the world had ever seen. 
And indeed, modern advertising techniques were permanently changed. Um, the art historian David Lubin has pointed out that before the war, most ads were just words. You know, the ads would be for arrow collars or something would just be words. Um, after the war, you don't see that anymore. You see images. Um, and that transformation really happens as a result of the war. Um, the advertising agency, given this job of selling the war, they really came of age and professionalized very quickly. Um, this cooperation between the government, between public and private organizations, and a whole industry of artists um, blurred the boundaries of public and private, the boundaries between patriotic and commercial. And in the process, the government began to address its citizens as consumers. We, we catch a glimpse of this in this slide where the War Department's announcement of a law to register for the draft um, appears alongside and in the same media format as, for instance, Excelsior Laundry. These, these kinds of injunctions are sort of right next to each other. But citizen consumers were also enlisted as participants in the transformation and spread of images in the media environment itself. And here we see volunteers postering in New York. And you might note that many of them are women. Um, I'll come back to that. They're wearing their high-heeled boots. Um, this and other evidence shows how the government invited citizens not just to follow its messages, but also to relay its messages to others. Archival records reveal commu communication loops between the D Division of Pictorial Publicity and those who ordered and displayed the posters. Again, how do we know if it was effective? Um, the, they actually kept records. They would ask librarians, for instance, which posters they liked the best and which ones they wanted to order. And going back and seeing these communications is one way of, of identifying which posters actually did resonate for people. Um, poster imagery sometimes went beyond the flat, two-dimensional limits of the medium. In at least some instances, putting up and making ads both became a kind of theatrical performance of citizenship and patriotism. This is famous actor Fatty Arbuckle putting up posters in Times Square. Um, and this is James Montgomery Flagg, one of the most successful illustrators of the early 20th century. And this was during a, a, a day called the Avenue of the Allies. It was happened on on um, Fifth Avenue in New York, and it was a bunch of essentially performances on the street. Um, he's pretending to draw his already famous poster, Tell That to the Marines. So the poster had already been a hit, and here he is kind of reenacting it for, for the public as they walk by. Um, artists, actors, film stars, they all used their fame to attract the public to the war effort. And in so doing, they worked to legitimize their own forms of media, which up until this period had been seen as crass, or at least mass forms of popular, but not high culture. Um, so here's Charlie Chaplin um, selling Liberty Bonds. Um, and th th all of the United Artists um, actors were very involved. Douglas Fairbanks Jr., they were all very involved in selling war bonds. Um, I believe that these are photographs taken in movie theater lobbies. Um, I've seen this in other images. Movie theater lobbies would become the staging ground for tableau vivant, where you know local high school kids would dress up like the posters and stand there enacting the poses in the poster with um, you know cans collecting for um, whatever the cause was. Um, People also dressed up as posters on sidewalks, in libraries, and particularly at fairs, um, county and state fairs. As all of these photographs show, individuals did more than hang posters. The government enlisted individuals, clubs, home economic departments, Girl Scouts, and other groups to interpret and portray its directions to other citizens, to become, in a sense, crowdsourcers of government propaganda. 
This is a letter. Um, it's actually here in Kansas City in the National Archive. Um, and it's from a woman in Iowa who was a home economics teacher um, in the Iowa State College Agricultural Extension Unit. Um, and she had been put in charge of a fair exhibit. What's interesting here is that the Food Administration, the United States Food Administration, not only asked her to design and staff the booth, but also asked her to supply them with a record of the posters that she had made and used in her fair booth. Um, exchanges like this show how this new government agency used media to cultivate its citizens and to get them to work for and to identify with the nation. People were not passive onlookers, but actually makers and interpreters of poster imagery. This is another homemade poster, which was erected on a bicycle and ridden through a small farming town in California. Not great. This image and the next one from Birmingham, Alabama, attest to the presence of images specifically outside of major cities. The wartime media landscape was not confined to cities or you know, to any one particular region. And indeed, the dissemination of common images across the various parts of the United States served to unify the nation in a way that had not happened before. Um, I like both of these images um, also because they're on wheels. <laughs> which reminds us you know, that we just don't know where these images went. I mean, they were just everywhere. They were moving through space um, in ways we just don't um, uh, realize. <clears throat> images were also found, if you look at the images and, and intuit who their audience is for, they, you can learn that they were also found in workplaces. Um, this one's from a grain elevator. Um, it, here's a school in Connecticut with all these war posters. You can see a lot of these war posters here um, in the museum. They were, of course, placed in stores. And they were also placed throughout the home, um, both in windows and in interior spaces. Um, particularly in kitchens. This is one that would have been shown in a window for passerbys to read. Um, but this one, which is a newspaper, it's the center fold of a newspaper that you could take out and paste up um, in your kitchen. Um, is you know they, they were designed with cute pictures and, and fun lettering so that you'd want to hang them up. And this one is about garbage. And though this one is just a printed text and doesn't have any great illustrations, I think it's significant because it shows just how deeply war discourse penetrated the everyday lives of ordinary people who were asked to think even of their trash cans in relation to the war effort. Another way in which discourse about the war infiltrated people's homes and even their imagination was through scrapbooks. Scrapbooks had been manufactured and sold for decades, but with the rise of the personal camera after the release, in particular, of the Eastman Kodak Brownie push-button camera in 1900, scrapbooks became a real, uh, a real craze. And this example, held here at the, at the National World War I Museum, was sold explicitly for use as a Liberty War scrapbook. And in it, we find a strange combination of private and public memorabilia for what is inside, um, what, what's inside this and other scrapbooks are both cutouts of images from magazines um, and handwritten entries and personal photographs. So it's this interesting collage of personal and public. Um, so the entry, which I'm sure you can't read here in her hand, says, to you, dear Uncle Sam, I dedicate this book as an inadequate token of my love for you. <laughs> and then she's cut out this, this picture of, of Uncle Sam and pasted it in. And images were cheap and plentiful enough to be cut out, pasted, and interpolated. Um, and, and this became really one of the ways that people mediated and processed their understanding of what was going on. Um, nor was the, here's another couple examples. This is a really wonderful item. This is a really popular war poster, and this scrapbook maker has cut out a small version of it 
and pasted it in. This is another very popular poster, but she has a, a small version of it. Um, okay, nor was the media landscape made up only of stationary images. Motion pictures were also vehicles of propaganda. And again, the Lusitania provides a classic case in point, so I've brought us back to this image by Speer. Coverage of the Lusitania began in the newspapers. A few days after the ship sank, an Irish newspaper carried the following account of a mother and child dragged to the shore from the wreckage. Quote, on the wharf lies a mother with a three-month-old child clasped tightly in her hands. Her face wears a half-smile. No one can bear to try to separate them. This account, I believe, I guess, is what inspired Fred Spears' poster. Um, his popular poster, in turn, I think also inspired the animated filmmaker Windsor McKay, who made a short film called The Sinking of the Lusitania. The Sinking of the Lusitania. the shot was decorated for it by the Kaiser, and yet they tell us not to hate the Hun. Okay, so I hope you caught that. This short film puts Spears' image in motion. Oh, whoops. Oh, I seem to be missing a slide. I had a, um, just a still from it, but maybe you saw in that um, Iris Inn, there was the same image of the sinking woman. Um, in other words, um, the poster and the animated short use the same iconography to tell the same story. The high art motif of a Madonna and child crossed into the world of advertising and then into animated film. The image, in other words, moved without provenance, without copyright or attribution, from text to image, from newspaper to sketch to lithograph, and into moving pictures. And its movement provides just one example of the ubiquity across media in the World War I visual environment um, that, I'm, that I'm interested in. Images moved from different media, from different formats, um, from print to tableau vivant, to letter, to poster, to scrapbook, from official text to um, improvised sketch and then mass produced um, uh, posters and right into American hearts and minds. And as these images moved from media to media, they made a larger cumulative impression on those who saw them and handled them. And I think their repetition constitutes a kind of an, an implicit truth claim. If so many people are telling the same story the same way, then it must be true. Um, the multiplication of images worked to intensify, broaden, and reinforce the message. Um, and that's really, I think, you know, sort of looking forward to the, to the Nazi moment. I think that's, a, that's a, a takeaway point that you can see at work there. There's a lot of repetition across different media that is um, very important to, to the way they, they worked their propaganda campaigns. Um, Many historians called World War I the first total war in that it was waged not only by soldiers at the front but by whole societies. Um, and I think in our current era in which such a small percentage of the population fights our wars for us, um, that it is truly hard to imagine what it felt like to be at war in 1917. Wilson and others in his government understood long before the declaration of war that it would require the whole country's participation. Um, and as my evidence here has been suggesting, it depended particularly upon women's participation as mobilized citizens. 
women had long been addressed as consumers, um, and many posters issued by the Food Administration might simply have functioned like advertisements to influence women as shoppers. Um, and you know, going back to something like this, we can see that it appeals to women in terms of nutrition and cost as consumers. But if you read the fine print, you'll find that this ad also makes it appeal, makes its appeal to women um, by appealing their, their new interest in, in the science of nutrition. Quote, potatoes are a true substitute for wheat, furnishing starch, protein, and valuable mineral salts. Recipes may be had free by calling up Miss Ida Schilling or Miss Helen Glass, government food expert on the Bell Phone Grand 3781, Polytechnic Institute, Kansas City. So women were, giving, were given titles and recognition as having valuable professional information needed to wage and win the war. Um, Likewise, this Food Administration kitchen card addresses women as if their kitchen is part of the industrial complex needed to win the war. And you may, if you're wondering, why are they so big on potatoes? <laughs> um, the, the Food Administration was very um, interested in diverting consumers away from things that shipped well. They wanted to ship sugar and wheat overseas. They corn, which is wet, you know, it doesn't ship as well, um, honey, um, they wanted those things to be used um, here at home um, and that way they, they could, um, they, they also wanted any prepackaged food they wanted to send over. So they wanted people to start growing their own vegetables and producing their own food. Um, I want to leave time for questions and, um, and comments. Um, so I will just sort of fast forward through these last few images um, and end with this picture of real women in the uh, land army um, and just say that on the one hand we, we're left as historians and, and students of, the, of this era we see a lot of posters and we see a lot of idealized images but I want us to sort of try to imagine the real people um, that those images are meant to influence and in some ways reference for us. Um, now, I'm sure this was staged, um, and I'm sure that um, it's posed, and it is in its way propagandistic, but this photograph tells us that women were not just symbols or just consumers of information, but agents and actors um, in the First World War. So I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take comments or questions. Thank you. And we certainly would like to invite anyone who is outside in our overflow area to come inside. At the bottom of each set of stairs, there are two microphones, and we would uh, love for you to come down and share your question there. If you're not able to come down, I will do my best to come to where you are, if need be. That way we can get your question on microphone. Thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering to what extent were the images, the posters that you are showing today, those that were used prior to the war, or to America's entry into the war, and those which were used while Americans were actually fighting in the war? Great question. Um, one of the things that is very difficult about working with posters is we don't have a complete archive. Um, we don't know exactly how many posters were made. We don't know how many were printed. Um, and the posters themselves sometimes have a date on them, them and sometimes do not. Um, and one of the things I have found as I've done research in various archives is the same image will be attributed to different people. It'll be dated differently. You know, so the archive at Yale will say this came out in 1916. The one here in, in the World War I Museum will say 1917. It's very hard to get that kind of information. When we can find information about, for instance, when the illustrator is um, 
known otherwise, if they have a memoir or papers, um, or their work has been documented, it's much easier. You know, James Montgomery Flagg's work or Howard Chandler Christie's work, it's much easier to date those. Um, but the ones that are unsigned, it's really hard unless you can find these photographs of the, the, the posters sort of up. You know, if you can date that, then, then that's a, a start. Couldn't you tell sometimes just by the message that, hey, the boys are fighting now? Or yes, not absolutely. Um, but one of the interesting things is that a lot of the posters after 1917 are asking men to enlist. Well, guess what? We have a draft, right? So you shouldn't technically have to advertise um, for people to enlist if it's in fact mandatory that they do so. Um, and so, but, but then there's the question of, of consent and enthusiasm. Um, and so, you know, but so it's hard, you know, you have to, you read the messages, um, and yes, that can help us date some, particularly if there's a particular um, uh, recruiting office location, then you know for sure, you know, we're, the, we're in it, the war is up and running. Um, but, you know, some ask um, people to enlist or are aimed at Americans asking them to enlist before we're in the war. They're asking them to come over and join. Um, in the Canadian forces or the British forces, things like that. So it's, it's a little tricky. Thank you. I think the next question comes from the gentleman in the white shirt. Yes. Um, given that even as early as 1914, 1915, the Allies had kind of the more emotionally charged message, you had mentioned that the, that the Central Powers had also done some propagandizing in the United States. I was wondering what kind of tone and themes they might have had given that they kind of lost that emotional battle early on. Right. I think that um, we, it's easy for us knowing, you know, knowing the way things turned out, you know, hindsight being 2020, <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to imagine the appeal of um, propaganda from the Entente. But they portrayed, believe it or not, they portrayed it as a war of aggression upon them. Um, and they particularly made that um, case to German Americans. So particularly in German language papers and publications, um, those were places where that argument got made. Um, that they, you know, that they had been ganged up on um, and, and that they, they had been aggressed. Um, there were also, I mean, they, they, you know, Germany was in many ways um, the height of culture. Um, you know, German music was very popular, German um, opera was very popular. So, you know, Germans would um, make the case that they were, you know, they were being unfairly represented as, um, as barbaric. You know, they, they really pushed back against that kind of a characterization. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm interested in the money that was spent during uh, World War I by the U.S. government uh, do you have any sort of statistics on that about how much is spent on propaganda? And second, were there, did state governments also get involved in that? Great question. Um, a lot of the people who, who uh, contributed to the propaganda effort volunteered their time. Okay, so the money, one of the interesting things, and that's what I was trying to get at with the quotes from the poster, advertising association, trade papers, they donated. The, the government actually did not have to spend very much money on propaganda. They got people to donate their time, their effort, their, their paper, their press, their, um, their guys to go hang them up on billboards. So it was pretty cheap, in fact, um, in the United States. Um, a lot of the people who were working for the Division of Pictorial Publicity were famous people and they, they just donated their time. It was their way of serving the country. Um, so I think my understanding is that number one, no we don't have exact figures. And number two, a lot of it was donated. Um, one of the things that makes it, again, kind of challenging to study this kind of ephemeral material is, yes, state governments and local agencies were very involved in producing propaganda. And if you go around to every national um, archive, you'll find, you know, they have a, you know, the one here in Kansas City 
collects for four states, right? If you go to all of them, you'll find different things in each one about different local efforts um, to advertise and raise money for, for different things. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very complicated story to tell. Um, and it's very decentralized. And that's one of the things that I think we as Americans, we can kind of nod and say, that doesn't surprise us. I mean, we, as a country, we don't go about it in a very top-down way. You know, we tend to want local school districts, for instance, to implement their version of the core standards or, or things like that. We're very uncomfortable when it's coming from Washington. And I think this is a case like that where there was a lot of local grassroots, if you will, um, interest in sort of shaping and controlling the, the message locally. Um, and that's very, very different, say, from Germany, where it really was very, the propaganda really was very centralized in its production. I don't need a microphone. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually repeat what you're saying because there are people outside so they can't hear you unless you have a bionic voice. So if you'll give me, give me pauses, then I'll repeat what you say. Oh, okay. Well, uh, the Fred Spears poster was actually released twice. Okay. Two different colors. And the first time it was released was for a state agency. Right. The Fred Spears uh, poster was released twice in two different colors. The first time for a state agency. And there was actually no place to go to enlist because they weren't even taking enlistment. Right. It was only the second time after the United States got involved in the war that it was released for the second time when it became the big hit. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it was produced first in Massachusetts, in right. Boston. <laughs> Right, and you're right. I mean, it says enlist, but enlist where? Right, right, exactly. That's the thing about the message being being difficult to um, interpret. If you take it literally, you would assume we were already at war, and that makes it tough to date these things. Yeah, thank you. If there are more questions, I know that Dr. James is more than willing to take them afterwards. Also, I know some of you brought in her book with you. Picture this, and I think she may have a pen if some of you want her to sign. So as Dr. Naylor comes up, I believe one more round of applause might be apropos. On your uh, sheets, you have an evaluation, and we'd invite you to complete that. There's a basket outside. We have postcards that provide information about the, uh, the next three lectures, remembering that it's next week. We want to see you here. Make sure that you register. It's going to be a really full house like tonight was, including overflow. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. One last round of applause for Dr. James. Thank you and good night.